Welcome to the New Planner Podcast, where it's all about helping you successfully enter the financial planning profession and accelerate your financial planning career. This podcast will help you understand the profession, become familiar with the various career paths available to you, and avoid the mistakes that limit your success. Join your host, Caleb Brown, to explore the human side of creating a successful planning career through interviews, personal experience, and insights from the trenches. Let's get started. Welcome to the 175th episode of the New Planner Podcast. This is Caleb Brown, your host. My guest today is Andy Blacker, an associate financial advisor at Delphinus Financial Advisors. Andy joins the show today to discuss how he transitioned to the financial planning profession after 10 years in the Marines. Starting with why he left the Marines, how his fiance got him thinking about a career in financial planning, and why he ultimately decided to take the plunge. Check out the middle part where he shares how he tackled the CFP coursework while still on active duty and passed the CFP exam on his first try. Plus how he knew starting his own firm wasn't the best fit for him, how he narrowed down what he was looking for and found his current firm, what he is doing in his current role, and how he and his fiance were able to navigate a 50% pay reduction. Stay tuned to the end as well where he talks about how his military career and the skills he acquired have helped him become a better planner and starting to add value to a firm in only a few short months. Plus some tips for new planners. If you're in the military and you're considering a career change, then this episode is for you. Hey, Andy, welcome to the New Planner Podcast. Hi, Caleb. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Always great to talk to a uh, uh, someone in the military. So thank you for making time for us and coming on the show. You got a really cool story, and that's why I wanted to have you on here, and it's a success story for us. So uh, why don't you start just by talking about it? Because you're a military career changer, right? You came out of the military. So why don't you just talk to us about why you even joined the military when you were coming out of school a long time ago? Okay. So I guess uh, not really a crazy, interesting story. I guess maybe I played too much Call of Duty growing up. I always thought the military was interesting. I liked it. Um, I liked the challenge and uh, you know, kind of the, the purpose behind it. And so I always wanted to do that, even in high school. I did ROTC at Virginia Tech. So I knew right away I was going to uh, be in the military. Um, yeah, I did that for about 10 years and then uh, got out in uh, the fall of 2023. So you mentioned Virginia Tech. You didn't go through the financial planning program, though, did you? Nope. I was a, a history major, so maybe sarcastically. It was super helpful transitioning uh, <laughs> into the financial planning world. <laughs> we do talk to you know history, English lit, you know some art majors, and a lot of those have made good, successful transitions like yourself into the, the profession. So you got your degree and then you joined the Marines. So I'm just curious, why did you pick that branch versus the other ones? I guess it's a good question. Maybe is I thought it was you know the the toughest, or I wanted to challenge myself, and uh, just always interested in it. Maybe uh, the uniforms looked sharp at the time, I thought, or something like that. But yeah, maybe just wanted the challenge and see if I could do it. And some of our other military listeners may not like this, but I do think they have the longest basic training, don't they? The, don't the Marines? It's the longest to get certified or whatever. I mean, maybe maybe it's not. I think it depends on maybe what your specialty ends up being. Yeah, there's multiple schools you go to. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Well, thanks for doing that. And thanks for your service. Maybe just talk to us too about your career there because, you know, just in looking at, and I know when we were working with you, you know, a couple of years ago, lots of leadership. I mean, you had a lot of people that you were leading and dealing with. So talk to us about just your military career and how you got in these leadership and these command situations. I was an infantry officer. So I was a platoon commander starting off. So in charge of, you know, 30, 40, 40 guys. Um, I was a rifle platoon, then a weapons platoon commander. So weapons platoon was the company's mortars, machine guns, and rockets. And then PCS multiple times all, all across the world, all across the United States. I was also a company commander a couple of times for a headquarters company at the regimental level. Uh, then a rifle company at 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines in Hawaii. Well, and how many, I mean, when you were the company, I mean, how many Marines was that? Maybe about 150 to 200, depending on, uh, you know, manpower fluctuations at the time. What position did you have where you were leading the most? I was a company commander, so probably around 180, something like that, give or take. What was that like? I mean, leading 180 people. How do you develop the skills and how do you do that successfully? I mean, I guess the training is pretty good to get you there. You know what you're doing for the most part. We still have a lot to learn. You, you kind of have a lot of the technical knowledge, um, but a lot of the practical, you know, putting things into practice, real world experience. You learn a lot of that from your non-commissioned officers and staff non-commissioned officers who, you know, have been in the Marine Corps for anywhere from two, four, 
to, you know, 15, 25 years. So they have a lot of experience to teach you. And it's a lot of that, you know, learning from them, but also walking the fine line of learning from them, but not letting them walk all over you and kind of just being a, a limp noodle, uh, kind of just figurehead. Yeah. It's like, you're the lieutenant, right? You're coming in and it's like, you basically, at least my understanding, and you got this Sergeant major over here that's been in the military like 30 years and like, but really he's kind of answering to you. I mean, how do you deal with that as a brand new sort of <laughs> lieutenant, second lieutenant coming out? I mean, there is there, was there tension there and how did you deal with it? I didn't really experience much tension. I feel like we get a bad rap in a lot of military movies. We're all like the nerdy type, I guess, in the movies. But, uh, I think coming in, you know, kind of being confident and, you know, talking to him, not really as a superior, but kind of like an equal in a sense, like my platoon sergeant at first, he's kind of like a right hand man. It's almost like a marriage in a weird way where you guys got to work together, walking the fine line of getting his experience, learning from him, but also kind of knowing when like something doesn't sound exactly right and kind of tweaking that or not going with it. And then also I found a lot if like, you know, I didn't listen to them or say, hey, I hear you, but we're going to do this. If it didn't work out and I made a mistake, going back to them and being like, hey, man, you are right. My bad. Next time, I'll listen to you. <laughs> Collaborative diplomacy. I love that. Yeah. I like that. I like that. You called me on it because I was actually thinking about like Platoon or one of those movies or whatever. It's like where the NCO is like, this officer doesn't know anything. This is horrible. They're getting everybody killed or whatever. So, yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks for setting the record straight. So, you, I mean, you just kind of progressed up, it sounds like. And then what happened at the 10 year? You just got tired of it and just wanted to get out? Yeah. Tired is the exact word I would say. I was just kind of burned out tired. I feel like I needed like a, a three month nap. I never deployed to the Middle East, but you know, did four deployments all around the world. I felt like I was always in the field, always gone at some training event, never really home. So kind of just wanted a, a normal life. How did financial planning pop up on your radar? So honestly, it was never on my radar at all until my fiance brought it up. I knew I wanted to get out. She kind of was helping me out. I didn't want to, I could, I could have stayed in, you know, 10 more years and just got my, gotten the pension. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get out. She kind of helped me jump off the ledge and take the leap into a new career field. Um, I always saved money and invested you know, at a very basic level my whole life. No, nothing crazy. But she introduced me to the world of financial planning. I was like, wow, this, this is a career. She introduced me to her uncle's financial planner, who's a CFP uh, in New Hampshire. Talked to him. He gave me a lot of career advice. And then I basically just listened to a bunch of podcasts, took notes, emailed random planners who had their podcasts or did things and asked them. Hey, can we talk for an hour? I uh, learned a lot from them as well. I even you know, sent a planner my resume. I was like, can I get a job? And he was nice enough to coach me along. And so instead of just ignoring me, he was like, hey, don't do that. This is why. Okay. okay. Well, uh, it sounds like you picked a good one there. So she's not a planner herself. She just thought it would be a good fit for you? Yep. She thought it'd be a good fit for me. I was looking around at a lot of jobs and found, you know, I could get, a, I guess, a decent like middle manager position somewhere. But I didn't really want to do that. Um, and then it turns out I have a interest slash growing passion for financial planning. And um, well, I love it so far. And then she, uh, so I was actually deployed just before I got out. I was deployed to Okinawa, Japan. And that's when I was talking to New Planner Recruiting, uh, you and I think it was Jesse, getting out there, kind of figuring out what I wanted to do and see what jobs are available. I was looking at the CFP coursework and she said, just, just start it. It's never a bad thing to just get some education. Just do it. So I, I owe her a lot, I guess. And now that I'm saying it all out loud. I think we're going to have to have her on uh, next in part two here. Get me off there. She's more interesting. <laughs> Man, that's really cool. That's awesome. So you started the CFP coursework when you were in, in Okinawa? Yep. I was in Okinawa. I started the CFP coursework January of 22. And then through Boston University, all online. Um, I finished maybe two courses by the time I got home in, in June. And then continued the coursework um, after I got out. So you were just doing that on evenings and weekends and your own God, I know something in the military, they can work you they can work you to death, man. They work you a lot. Oh, I know it. Yep. College <laughs> roommate who basically got out of the Air Force is like, man, I'm working like three jobs. You know, they're they're killing me here. Uh so you just tuition assistance, is that how you were using to pay it for it or what? No, I, I paid for it myself. Tuition assistance I think has some service for officers, especially you incur some service obligation. Yeah. So I didn't, want to, I didn't want to fall into that trap and get stuck. Hold it handcuffed. Yeah. We'll pay for it, but then you got to stay 17 more years. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Gotcha. So you work through this. I, I just want to make a point here because I have a lot of career changers that reach out and also need to like, you were working on this while you were working full time in a demanding you know job and you know, had a lot of responsibility. So, all right. So then you, you complete the coursework and then you take the exam. How'd that go? 
Yep. Uh, so I completed the coursework a little over a year after I've started. So maybe March of 2023. And then I started the review course through the Boston Institute of Finance, uh, BIF. So I did that right when I kind of finished the coursework. And I took the exam in July of 2023, luckily passed it uh, on the first try and put that behind me. And then I took a couple, couple weeks off, then went into studying for the Series 65, which made a little bit out of order, um, but then passed that a couple months later. And this is all while you were still full-time in the military? No, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so I got out of the military fall of 22. So I didn't need to do half the coursework once I was out of the military. Was that at all scary? Like, hey, I'm walking away from this job, the only thing that I've known and my income and kind of for this something, I don't know if it's going to work out. Just walk us through that. Uh, yeah, it was absolutely a challenge and maybe, I don't know if scary is the right word, but int- intimidating, I guess. I'd only known the military, um, you know, and everyone's always like, it's it's a tough world out there, you know, that you, you, people can't make it. But then you think like, you know, 99% of people aren't in the military and they, they somehow make it. So my fiance honestly helped out a ton. She's got a, a good job um, and was very, very supportive. Um, so we were able to take a, a step back in income and just kind of go for it. Nice work on getting the coursework done, the CFP pass, and then you went right into the Series 65. I mean, you could have said, I'm taking a couple months off. Uh, why did you do that? Why did you go with the Series 65 instead of the SIE or some other license? So I actually did the SIE while I was deployed just before the CFP coursework. I started that. I like the planning world more. I don't really want to be in like sales or, or just pure investments. And maybe I'm thinking of it wrong. That's my, that's my interpretation of it, I guess, the different routes. I like the Series 65, CFP, uh, more like planning focus route than more kind of just like investments, I guess. Got it. So you were looking at the RIA model, the RIA channel. Yep. That's a better way to put it. Yep. And then how how did you, well, I mean, to be fair, there are RIAs out there that could care less about financial planning and just only do investments, which is muddying the waters for newer people. You know, it's like, I thought they were planning since you're like, not all of them. Um, man, confusing out there, confusing world. Um, so, well, that's why we're here. We have this podcast. So, uh, you know, my, I touch, I touch on that in my book too. Like you gotta be careful, uh, when you're interviewing with these people, but okay. So what position were you looking for? Did you have a, a feel for like where you were going to fit in with one of these firms? Really just, uh, I guess an associate financial planner. I was kind of just kind of get my, get my foot in the door, trying to learn about the industry. I knew I didn't really want a sales job. I didn't want to cold calls and, and just bring in clients. Um, I wanted to kind of be a part of the team, maybe like everyone working together, not really competing against each other for more clients or, or more sales, that kind of stuff. So is that why you didn't pursue your own firm? I don't think I really knew enough to start my own firm. I think I knew that. I think that would have been a really steep hill to climb initially. Well, I mean, it's your solo practitioner, you hang your own shingle. I mean, that's, that's not a team usually, or <laughs> it's just one, one person. So I remember when I first started the recruiting firm and, you know, even kind of being an introvert and some of those are like, I just, I need to talk to somebody. I need to, you know, I need to just start calling people because I am like, I miss my office uh, when I was working virtually by myself. All right. So you're making good progress and then you get the 65 and then you start looking for job opportunities. Then I think we got connected. Just talk to us about sort of what happened next and getting introduced to some of these firms and finding the fit. Uh, well, I guess maybe I'm, I'm mixing up the timeline a little bit or explaining it poorly. So I was already with Delphinus and Anthony before even you know having the coursework done before CFP before sixty five. So he hired me. Maybe took a took a big risk on me. You know, hoping hey, hopefully this guy can can prove himself a little bit. That was late. That was late twenty twenty two when you just got out of the military, right? Correct. Yep. So yeah, he hired me brand new. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute because usually the firms don't want that. They want you to go do all this stuff so they don't have the risk, which is understandable. Just talk to us about the interview process and why he was a good fit. Um, so we interviewed, I was still in Japan um, when we first met virtually, and I think it ended up going well, obviously. I'm still working for him today, happily working for him today. And again, I, I realized that the chance he took on me as a you know blank slate, you know, hiring me without really proving myself too much. I, I, at the time, I completed, I think, two courses at, at BU for the CFP program. Um, but I think he also kind of wanted a blank slate, so I didn't have any maybe bad habits or, um, you know, preconceived notions or something like that. So he could kind of teach and coach and mentor me uh, into how he wanted me to be. You mentioned taking a chance on you. I mean, is that increase the loyalty maybe that you might have to, to someone like that and help you get your start? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I think at the time, you know, as I learned more about the industry, I learned more about it. I look back and I'm like, wow, you know, that was a big chance they took on me. 
And luckily, I think for both of us, it's worked out uh, up to this point. So what, what position did you start in? What were you doing when you first started? Um, so I was an associate planner and basically just being his right-hand man, you know, we did everything together. I was in every meeting from day one, helping out and learning and observing and um, helping him with everything from insurance, investments, estate planning, taxes, basically being in receive mode um, all day, every day, and slowly learning and being able to contribute, which was nice after a little while of you know, getting there and being like, wow, this is so much, you know, but now I'm doing much more now. How many months went by before you thought you were contributing? I think I was contributing up to my ability initially, but I kind of started getting my feet under me as I think I completed more classes through the CFP program and started learning more. And it's a fine line to walk. You don't want to contribute, you know, beyond your ability and mess something up for a client. Um, but you also don't want to be, you know, like a liability, you know, for, for 10 years to the firm and not do anything until you, until you learn everything. So, so maybe like, is it six months or something into it? It's like, okay, I feel like I'm getting this. I'm sort of helping out and they're not just having to like spend so much time with me where it's like, I mean, is that, does that make sense? You're like, yep. Yep. Yeah. It was definitely, yeah, I'd say maybe three to six months before I started really learning what's happening. And that's kind of a testament to Anthony's patience with me. Kind of, you know, he couldn't be as efficient and do as much because he had to teach me and, and, maybe do things more slowly than he ordinarily would. And talk to us about just the, I know you said your fiance had a, had a good job and you guys could take a step back, but for some people they can't do that. So they're scared to leave the BAH and all the entitlements that they get from the military to go into the private sector where their salary might be higher, but then they have to, they have a full bore of expenses. So maybe for the people out there, how was that comparable to you? I mean, how, how big a step did you have to take a pretty large step back? I just got promoted a major maybe like a month before I got out. That was anything special. It was just my time. But I just say that just because this the salary became a third or, or a half of what I was making. Okay. So you took a, let's just call it 50% pay cut. So whether that's a major, was that, a, is that 04? Yep. I was an 04. Okay. Got it. All right. I mean, you were progressing. I mean, you could have stayed another, what, 10 years and you gotten, was a, a lieutenant colonel or something and just kept <laughs> working your way up, right? Yep, I could have, but yeah, I just I was I was done. I was mentally done. Wanted to call it quits. And, and maybe talk about that for a minute. I mean, for all the people that are listening, like, oh, my, you know, I'm, we're going to lose our BAH or whatever it is, or meal plan, or or Tricare or whatever it is. And I mean, how, how did you do that? I mean, how did you like? I've got the confidence to make the switch. I'm leaving all that behind. And, and has it worked out? And is it more rewarding? Uh, yeah, absolutely worked out. Absolutely more rewarding uh, now. Honestly, for my fiance again, maybe she get her on the podcast, but I don't think I would have done it not for her. I think I'd still be in if I hadn't met her and she had convinced me to to get out. She was in the army as well, um, but her her skills more directly transferred to the real world <laughs> than mine did. Gotcha. Okay, so you just I mean, really just came down to her kind of pushing you kind of outside of your your comfort zone. But we talked at the top of the show about all this leadership and you're managing all these people and you're having to deal with people who don't, you know, want to do what they're supposed to, or they don't show up or they need, I mean, you probably had people coming to you for like the AER loans and all this stuff and that they had to get, I mean, that's transferable. So why, so, and maybe it was just tongue in cheek, but why do you think you didn't have transferable skills? Obviously transferable skills in that sense, but I mean like the technical or hardcore like financial knowledge um, that I learned through the, the CFP coursework that, you know, I didn't learn that obviously in the, in the Marine Corps. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I don't think anybody was expecting to be a tax planning expert, you know, with like zero yeah, experience. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> but being responsible for a couple hundred people's lives and, you know, millions or billions of dollars of equipment. And I mean, that's a big deal. And most people don't have that experience. Yeah. So I think, you know, like the general baseline of responsibility, you know, hard work, discipline, I helped out a ton. You know, I don't think I'm anything special in the military, but I think that kind of helped out a little bit going to the real world, you know, time management skills and discipline helped out a lot. And I don't really mean discipline, like ironing a uniform, making your bed every morning, but in terms of like making yourself do what you don't want to do, um, you know, like studying before work or after work or you know, I was in 29 Palms in the desert studying for the the SIE exam, which obviously didn't want to do, but, you know, made myself do it. We're helpful in the, in the transition. Prioritization. You know, I just shot a YouTube video on this because this is what we, the complaint we get back from firm owners. These people don't know how to prioritize anything. And, you know, a lot of times it's not necessarily the candidate's fault, just a lack of communication and, and expectations. But, you know, just being able to prioritize all this stuff, you would not have been able to succeed in the military without some level of 
prioritization skills. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and it, and it comes with time because, you know, I could prioritize things in the military easily. You know, after being there 10 years, I knew what mattered and what didn't. Um, that took a little time to do when I transitioned to the financial planning world. I could prioritize, but I needed to know like what was important, what wasn't in this new lens uh, to do that more effectively. So how did it work for you to kind of be going from the guy in charge to the guy not in charge? It was honestly weird and difficult in one way, but super easy in another, um, where I feel like I was always in charge of people and it was almost you know, a nice change of pace to, you know, have time to be a little selfish now and only look after myself and my fiance rather than like 200 people. So it was almost nice and a breath of fresh air in, in one sense. But in another, it was, you know, very humbling experience where I, had a, I was somebody, you know, <laughs> in the military. And now I'm just some associate who's learning and a very humbling experience. It took take many steps back and learn and, and be Nick, the new guy. And all of a sudden you learn, you learn two things and then you learn 10 more things you don't know. So you feel like you're taking two steps forward and three steps back, but kind of just, just keep going and, and, and getting there. And you're not just any associate. You're the associate that's working on those clients and taking care of those people at your current firm. So how's your role transitioned? I mean, you've been there a year and a half or so. How, how's your role transitioned and what are you doing now? It's transitioned in the sense where I'm you know doing more on my own. You know, I first started off with you know, hey, run every trade by me, or you know, we'll do trades together and stuff like that. Now I'm do- probably doing ninety, you know, eight percent of the trades myself. If there's a complicated case, or you know, hey, there's no way around this, we're gonna take some of these capital gains. You know, I run those by uh, my boss. You know, it's running certain types of meetings as well by myself now. You know, taking more responsibility, communicating with clients now without running things by him. But also, I think having the understanding of he's giving me a little bit of leash and I don't want to hang myself with it. So knowing when to be like, ah, this feels wrong. Let's run this by Anthony and kind of get his advice on it. We want to get more people like you in the profession. What is your suggestion on how we can do that? I mean, I think these podcasts, like that's kind of how I got my interest at first, um, listening to these podcasts. So it's nice. Hopefully, um, I don't sound too delusional talking about myself on this podcast. Hopefully, it just helps somebody believe they can do it or get some advice or or maybe just a little bit of interest in the profession. I think just getting the kind of word out there that it's a profession. I don't really know how to solve that or crack that nut, but I wasn't even really aware of, you know, financial planning being a profession, especially the, you know, RIA route. I just envision it being like, you know, hey, big bankers at the big banks and big advisement firms. We're all very thankful for your fiance and getting you over to us. But my concern is if it wouldn't have been for her, we never you would have gotten over here. So <laughs> like, I mean, all any career change, it's like, how do we get more of you guys to see this side of things? This has been great, Andy. Any final tips or anything you want to share to uh, any of the new planner audience that's, that's listening? Um, I guess the one thing I guess I leave people with is just don't give up if you want to do it. Um, I think multiple times throughout my journey, transitioning and even studying, and there was multiple times where I was like, man, is this even going to happen? Like, there's no way I can learn this. There's no way I can do it. And everyone has those moments, but you know, no one sees it. It's like Instagram. Everyone sees your high highs. No one sees your low lows. You don't post your, you know, you being sad on Instagram. But I mean, everyone has low times. Everyone can get through it. Even you know, during the CFP exam, I sat there and I was like, man, I'm gonna have to retake this thing. I guess, but in my head, I was like, I'm gonna retake it if I don't pass it. So just keep working hard. Don't give up and get through the tough times. And, and one final question: I mean, what's been the most joyous thing about this? profession for you that's that's kept you going i think the client interactions i really enjoy you know meeting the clients speaking to the clients um we work with them a lot so we're getting to know them and you know them seeing you multiple times and you know asking about you saying hi and and us helping them and them coming to us with a problem and us fixing that problem and seeing them and their faces be like wow now i feel better about this this is a problem solved andy we appreciate your service sir thanks so much for coming on the show thanks for having me appreciate it Thanks for joining us for this episode of the New Planner Podcast. If you're ready to discover the top career paths for financial planners and see which track is best for you, we created a free guide to help you. Grab your copy of the Financial Planner Career Roadmap at newplannerrecruiting.com slash roadmap. There, you'll also find more tools and resources all created to help you build a successful financial planning career. Tune back in next week for another episode. And until then, we're here to help you succeed.